Uh, well, good morning and um, welcome to this uh, session this morning. Uh, Connect to Epistemically Prosper, the Ethics of Belief in the Digital Age. I'm delighted uh, to be um, chairing this session uh, uh, with Dr. Brian Ball. Um, so the, um, so if you're those who don't know me, I'm Mike Wardle. I'm the Chief Executive here at ZN. Um, and as you know, we run a series of webinars that range quite widely um, over um, the topics to do with economics, finance, um, but, but also science history uh, and today maybe philosophy as well as mathematics. Um, I need to say a brief thank you to our sponsors who uh, allow us to run these series of events. Uh, we really are grateful for their um, support um, without which we couldn't uh, do the work we do uh, and bring this knowledge and excitement to you. Um, my job today is to uh, get out of the way quite quickly see if we can hear from Brian uh, his keynote presentation but just have some housekeeping matters to do first. First of all the session is being recorded uh, that means that there'll be a video available within the next 48 hours, which will be posted on our website. Um, that means that you'll be able to either go back and watch again if you find yourself fascinated, um, or you can share the link with friends and colleagues who you think might uh, have an interest in this today's subject. Uh, secondly, um, for those of you who haven't used GoToWebinar before, uh, the way that you can put post questions and make comments uh, during the uh, session today is to find the questions tab on the dashboard on your screen and type in your question or your comment, uh, and that will be fielded during the Q&A session uh, after Brian's keynote presentation. And just to say that uh, we will pass on the email contacts of anyone who does ask a question during the session to Brian, uh, so that if there's a need for follow-up uh, conversation, uh, we can make that happen. Um, so that's all by way of introduction and housekeeping. So I just want to introduce Dr. Brian Paul, Associate Professor of Philosophy at Northeastern University. Um, Brian, uh, the floor's yours. Very much looking forward to hearing your presentation. Good. I'll, I'll just um, launch in then. Uh, basically, this is a, a, an introduction to um, my polygraphs project that I've done uh, with, with some colleagues. Um, so by way of context, um, I think people need knowledge in order to act, right? So if you want to get um, a train to Paris, uh, it won't do to turn up at Paddington Station. You need to know that the train goes from St. Pancras. Uh, if, um, you know, I also think that, of course, we act sometimes under uncertainty, under conditions of un uncertainty. Um, and uh, um, when that happens, right, so we, we might, uh, when we leave the house, say, wonder whether we should take an umbrella um, with us. Um, so yeah, uh, as I say, people need uh, to to know things in order to act. Even when they act under uncertainty, they uh, I think ground their uh, action in knowledge. So you might uh, want to decide uh, whether to um, take an umbrella with you when you when you leave the house and not know whether it will rain before you return. But still, you might know, uh, say, that the BBC projects that there's a fifty percent chance of rain, something like that. I think also that um, people, of course, act uh, collectively sometimes, so uh, they might need to make a decision in a business organization or um, uh, on a large scale in a democratic society. And in that kind of case, uh, it's group knowledge that's, that's needed. And so uh, we can ask, how can um, groups get to have knowledge, uh, especially under adverse conditions? I'm going to talk a little bit about um, misinformation uh, in, this, in this context. So one way... Um, is for the individuals that constitute the groups in question to learn from their network of peers. Uh, so perhaps they can um, connect to epistemically prosper. I, I ask cheekily uh, referencing the, the Lord Mayor of the City of London's um, uh, program um, title, just to say epistemically means basically in a, in a knowledge respect. Uh, so um, maybe they can uh, gain knowledge by connecting. That's the idea. And uh, to reassure um, uh, uh, the audience, the answer will uh, be uh, a, a yes to that, though there are some qualifications, uh, in fact. So basically, the talk will report the models, methods, and initial findings of, uh, of this project that I've been working on. Um, it's an interdisciplinary project supported by the Royal Society, amongst others, and it uh, deploys models that were devised in economics. They were then adapted by uh, philosophers. Uh, and we run computer simulations um, on graph data sets to investigate knowledge and ignorance in communities of inquiring agents. Uh, next slide, please. 
So my um, talk will will touch on a few things. We'll we'll t talk about the role of social network structure in producing knowledge and in sustaining ignorance. We'll also talk about uh, some models of mistrust and the possibility of opinion polarization. Uh, we'll look at some measures of of group knowledge and. We'll also talk about the effects of mis and disinformation in both trusting and cautious uh, communities. And a common theme here is going to be the persistence of this trade-off between error and agnosticism uh, that's first discussed in uh, the 19th century in, in the debate about the ethics of belief, as it was then called. Uh, and I'm going to update that for the 21st century in the digi digital age. Next slide, please. So just to give you some uh, context about our um, models, we treat communities uh, as networks of agents uh, that are investigating a hypothesis and that are communicating relevant uh, evidence with their neighbors. When we do this, we make a number of idealizations. Uh, we think they're they're quite useful uh, idealizations. Of course, they, they can be challenged, um, um, and I'm happy to talk about that, but the assumptions that we make that are key to kind of understand is that we assume, first of all, that the opinions that we're looking at concerned factual matters. So they're either correct opinions or they're incorrect opinions. They're either true or they're false. Okay. Um, secondly, we take it that our agents are rational in the sense that they're uh, appropriately responsive to evidence, both in their thought and in their action. And moreover, the evidence uh, that they encounter is stochastic or chancy. You can think of it as um, the results of coin tosses, uh, where the there's a bias in the coin and the agents are trying to determine whether that bias is towards heads or towards tail and the, and the tails and the evidence they collect is the string of um, results of those coin tosses. Next slide. So uh, can we connect to epistemically prosper? Um, Kevin Zolman found that denser uh, networks are faster in arriving at a consensus view, but they're also more uh, error prone. Um, so um, there's a kind of a trade off here. And uh, Sasha, are you able to share that uh, linked visualization? Yeah, great. Um, so if you just click at the top left, the Barabasi Albert thing again, then we should get the animation running. Yeah, or yeah, there we go. So you can see uh, on basically this is two ways in which the agents who are marked on the, around the peripheries are um, connected. Uh, on the right, they're completely connected, so everybody knows everybody. Uh, and you can see that simulation is already finished. The other one, where they're less well connected, um, actually runs for a little longer. So it takes, them, takes those agents longer um, uh, to uh, d determine an answer. But we also see that the agents in the complete network here are um, Arriving at the wrong answer, uh, right? They're, they're, um, they're, they think that the tail is biased towards uh, tails when in fact it's biased towards heads, right? And um, if you select the star network, um, oh, yeah, in that one, we get a similar thing, right? The differently structured network. Again, um, the uh, agents that are completely connected end up arriving at an answer uh, already now. Uh, but then it takes a little longer for the agents in the star network to um, determine uh, whether that that, head is, that, tail, that coin is biased towards heads or towards tails. Um, so thanks, uh, Sasha, if we can go back to the slides. Uh, so obviously I should say that those little illustrations don't are not themselves an argument to that effect, right? They're just a way of uh, communicating what we found in our in our data um, that uh, there's a greater danger uh, in these um, better connected networks of error, uh, uh, but they are quicker uh, in, in forming an opinion. So we also did some work that uh, found that ignorance uh, persists differentially in networks with different shapes. All right, so you saw we had some different shaped networks there, a star network or a complete network or what have you, but um, we found that even when the networks have the same overall connectivity, that is the same average number of connections per, per node, we can get some um, differences in how long it takes to arrive at uh, a correct consensus view, uh, depending on, uh, say, the distribution of those um, connections, right? 
So that's what I mean by the, the shape. Uh, next slide, please. So um, a couple of other philosophers uh, based in California, Kaylin O'Connor and James Weatherall, I have this nice book, The Misinformation Age, um, where they uh, report some, some work they've done developing um, what I'm calling homophily-based models of mistrust. So the idea here is that agents will trust each other more when their beliefs are more similar. In that respect, there's a, uh, there's a likeness for sameness, right? Uh, this is implemented for those uh, interested by using Jeffrey's rather than uh, Bayes' rule for conditionalization uh, upon receiving evidence. Um, crucially, in some of these models, opinion polarization is a possible outcome. So what that means is that the simulation can actually arrive at a state in which some agents believe that the biased coin B uh, is better at getting heads than the fair coin A, uh, right? In other words, the coin is biased towards heads while others believe exactly the opposite, that uh, it's less likely than the fair coin to get uh, a, a heads outcome. But no evidence uh, produced by the B believers will have any rational effect anymore on the beliefs of the A believers. And so there's no more, there are no further rational dynamics uh, that can play out. And so we stop the, the simulation at that point uh, with um, the community not having a consensus opinion at all. O'Connor and Weatherall report a, a bit about this kind of model, but uh, not in a way that is um, statistically kind of um, precise. And so uh, we ran simulations of our own. We found that uh, where polarization is possible, there's more long-term ignorance. That is, simulations end without uh, without arriving at a uh, consensus in the truth um, uh, more often. And we also found that whether polarization is possible or not, nevertheless, the achievement of knowledge that, or a convergence to the truth um, when it does happen is delayed significantly. Next slide, please. So we've so far um, uh, up to this point in the talk been, been taking a group to know something only if uh, there's a kind of consensus belief in the truth within that group. Um, that of course is not the only way we could think about what it is for a group to have an opinion. All right, we might try some other measures of, of group belief. Um, and amongst those other measures, uh, some are sensitive to the structure of the network um, of, of, the, of the community. So we found that uh, structure sensitivity in the aggregation of individual attitudes makes a difference to the group attitude. Uh, in the graph uh, here, um, we can see that uh, over time or over simulation steps, um, uh, the um, fraction of the community that, or let's say the the fraction of the votes uh, cast by community members um, uh, increases, uh, uh, sorry, the fraction of the votes in favor of the true opinion increases over uh, time, but it does so more quickly when we give more votes to people depend uh, if they have more connections in the network. Um, so uh, better connected agents can end up um, Right. If we give them more influence in determining the outcome of the group, uh, then the group arrives at the truth more quickly. Next slide, please. Just kind of for fun, uh, we also uh, had a look at um, this uh, historical data about various parties in Elizabethan and, and, and subsequent um, eras, including the philosopher uh, Francis Bacon. I guess uh, because one of our collaborators was involved in designing this uh, this. Um, presentation of the data uh, on the Six Degrees of Francis Bacon uh, site. If you go to the next slide, when we uh, imported the data from this, um, we found that it's good to be king um, <laughs> because the most influential nodes, that is the, the nodes uh, in the network that were most central, uh, most of them are, are, are uh, king or queen uh, or uh, lord protector. <laughs> so they're they're the best. Uh, connected agents here. Um, the one kind of obvious exception, there's an archbishop, but there's also someone who, if um, you're like me, you probably haven't heard of. Turns out that person is a, a historian of uh, Oxford, uh, and probably um, there's a bit of bias in, in the data because we know more about Anthony Wood's um, connections than maybe some other people. In any case, what you see in the little animation is that uh, very, very quickly, the nodes that have a 
high degree centrality or highly central in the network, their beliefs go straight to the truth very quickly, whereas the ones with low degree centrality are still trickling up many, many simulation steps later, sort of 40,000, 50,000 steps later, they're still uh, discerning the truth. Um, okay, next slide, please. We then turned our attention to um, modeling communities that um, inhabit kind of uh, poor informational environments. Uh, so they're in, they're in uh, difficult circumstances when it comes to the acquisition of knowledge. And this is uh, one of the, the, the new things that we've done um, in our modeling. So in particular, we introduced both myths and disinformants into the communities uh, that we uh, are, are modeling. The misinformants are agents that um, they convey false information, but it's overall neutral information. Um, disinformants are those that convey information that's not only false, but also actually biased against the truth, right? Because they're trying to convince people of, of something false. And in, in the little image here, you can see the uh, the light blue dots are kind of representing the the, the noise put out by, by misinformants, right? They're reporting anywhere between kind of zero uh, coin tosses came up heads to a hundred uh, coin tosses came up heads uh, with a mean of 50, right? So that's neutral overall. Um, by contrast, the uh, the dark blue dots are the actual signal in this, uh, the, the reliable information coming from the uh, truthful uh, agents. Uh, and that's, uh, as you can see, kind of biased towards the truth, right? There's a, a slight, um, slightly more than uh, half of the point us reports uh, are reports of heads. Uh, so that's the kind of informational environment that our agents uh, in these networks will be encountering. Um, next slide, please. So what we found uh, using these models um, is that in the first instance, the more misinformants there are, the less likely it is that a correct consensus will emerge in the community, okay? And that, um, we can see that in, in the graph here, um, uh, the bottom um, axis label has, has come off, but it's that's the reliability increasing uh, to the right in the um, it, it, the reliability in the network. That is how many of the agents uh, are reliable or truth telling agents. Right, as we can see on the far right, they're all uh, they're all reliable. Uh, towards the left, they're uh, more significant numbers of uh, unreliable agents and um, Fewer of our 500 simulations end up arriving at the truth uh, under those under those circumstances. Um, we also find that it takes longer to arrive at the truth in the presence of this mis and disinformation. Um, not only that, for a given level of misinformation, there's a trade-off between correctness and speed in information processing strategies. So um, here, what we have, uh, what we're labeled uh, as aligned binomial. That's um, in the presence of misinformation, binomial distribution misinformation, uh, um, those the agents in those communities are being cautious of the information that they're receiving because they know that there are misinformants out there, and so they're discounting some of the evidence that they that they uh, receive, uh, and that um, makes them more truth conducive in the sense that they get the right answer more often than those who are gullible or, or trusting. Um, but it, it takes them considerably longer um, to arrive at that opinion. Um, so that's the, uh, the the sixth point there, that um, for a given level of misinformation, there's a trade-off between correctness and, and speed. Next slide. Yeah, we also saw that in the presence of disinformation, uh, the ability of the trusting agents to discern the truth just plummets. Um, they just get the wrong answer uh, quite quite often. More skeptical agents or more cautious agents um, are, are a little better on that uh, in that regard. But again, they're very considerably delayed in arriving at the truth. Uh, and we also saw, uh, and that's what's in this graph, we saw that a very small number of influential misinformants can have an effect that's comparable to that of a much larger number of misinformants chosen uniformly at random. So um, the blue line, this is uh, from the findings from a particular simulation we ran on a thousand node uh, email network. And uh, the blue line is where everybody is um, uh, reliable. Uh, and uh, the on the y-axis, we get over time. Sorry, on the x-axis, we have a number of steps in the simulation. Uh, and um, we can see that the 
correct opinion, belief in the truth is, is increasing uh, and it um, increases um, most quickly when everybody's reliable. Um, interestingly, uh, the orange line is when we have just 10 misinformants in the network, 10, of a, 10 out of a thousand, but they're the 10 most influential nodes uh, in the network by degree centrality. Uh, and the green line is uh, when uh, those 10 nodes are disinformants. And we can see that there's a considerable delay uh, caused by just a small number here of um, unreliable um, informers in our networks. Uh, next slide. So uh, as a philosopher, I can't resist making a couple of philosophical remarks. Um, basically, um, we, we see years ago, the philosopher and psychologist William James is pictured there. Uh, he drew to our attention a fundamental issue in uh, what was called the ethics of belief. So whether to employ skeptical belief forming practices so as to avoid error or to be less cautious in the hope of grasping the truth in a timely manner. His example, at least one of his examples, is um, uh, when considering a marriage proposal uh, that, that is issuing one, when considering whether to issue a marriage proposal, uh, you might not want to wait uh, for uh, the moment to pass uh, while you gather further evidence still. Um, the opportunity might be might be lost. Um, and so I think uh, this um, analogous kinds of things, for instance, um, as we um, try to tackle climate change, uh, right, we might not want to wait uh, indefinitely for further and further evidence uh, to come in. Um, the, the opportunity might be missed. So uh, one of the key findings uh, of, of our work so far in this space is that um, the problem of the ethics of belief is still with us in the digital age. Um, we saw Kevin Zolman uh, pointing to a trade-off between, on the one hand, small groups being more efficient or faster in forming an opinion uh, because they're better connected, and on the other hand, uh, being uh, more accurate in the opinions that they form because they're actually less well connected and so uh, more epistemically diverse and more diverse in, the, in their outlook. We found uh, that in the presence of misinformation, more cautious communities are more accurate, but also less efficient. It takes them uh, quite a lot longer to arrive at the accurate opinion. Uh, next slide, please. So um, very briefly, we're uh, thinking about uh, future directions for, for our research, and we kind of anticipate four uh, such directions. One is we'd like to continue, continue to refine the theory in the background uh, and, and generate some new models um, to then run simulations using those models. Um, we, we're also looking to uh, get um, some more real-world validity in our findings, uh, so uh, by using new data sets. Uh, I'm also keen to explore further applications of the framework, uh, looking at kind of new areas where uh, we might uh, try to model communities uh, that are that are seeking the truth. And then finally, um, our code is devised in, in a such a way that we can um, readily use machine learning on the data that we generate uh, the graph data sets we have. So we we haven't taking advantage of that uh, capacity just yet. Uh, and so we plan to make um, use of new techniques uh, in the future. And um, this is just a kind of a shout out to those here. If you are interested in working with us on any of these, please do get in touch with me. As Mike says, he's gonna share my email with those who um, inquire. So uh, next slide. Uh, this is just now to remains to thank our funders, the Royal Society who are uh, pictured there. Thanks also to um, my team, uh, specifically my, my co-authors uh, on the, the work that we've been doing that I'm reporting here. Uh, also, thanks to the information designers who produced some of those animations uh, that you saw. Uh, thanks to the FS Club for organizing the talk and thanks to you for listening. Well, thank you so much, Brian. Um, really fascinating view of um, how to look at groups and information. It, um, did remind me of um, something I did when I studied sort of change management theory, and I just wondered whether we could just go there a bit. There's a kind of defining change management a messy problem. That's where there isn't an obvious solution. There's a very widely distributed um, stakeholder network, um, and so on. And one of the theoretical models says the thing to do is to keep the window of opportunity when there's still opportunity to change your mind about the solution as as long as possible. Um, and that seems to fit with some of what you've been saying about you know taking time to get to the right decision 
um, when there may not be a clear answer. But I just wonder whether you had any thoughts. That's a really nice um, question, Mike. Thank you, <laughs> because um, you know that pushes in a slightly different direction than um, some of what I was suggesting. Right, that the James thought about uh, marriage uh, proposals was, you know, sometimes we need to be more timely rather than um, than than uh, kind of, uh, I guess, more reflective, let's say. Um, and the cases that I've been thinking a bit about, uh, you know, I mean, there's some work about uh, misinformation coming from tobacco uh, firms in the 60s and 70s to try to slow the public uh, awareness that there was a causal link between smoking and uh, and, and cancer and um, you know the the evidence kind of was there and available uh, to convince people um, uh, if it was uh, taken on board quickly enough but it, it just took a long a long time and there's been some um, work documenting that so I, you know I was sort of looking at cases where um, we might want to move more quickly but that's a nice example where uh, we might want to move a little more slowly um, and um, this is why I kind of think the uh, it, it's salutary to be reminded of the fact that there really is a trade-off here, right? That is um, that it's not a, a simple, um, you know, we can't just say, oh, well, this is the, the best way to proceed always, <laughs> right? That it might be context sensitive, uh, which um, which strategies are, are, are worth uh, pursuing in, in in different circumstances. I'm kind of intrigued as well about the change management case, I mean, um, you know, what I was alluding to uh, previously, right, we, we saw that network structure matter, not just network, not just kind of individual information processing strategies, but network structure actually matters. And so I'd be, um, you know, curious to look in uh, a little more fine detail at uh, organizational structure theory, right, in, in relation to this, and, and maybe even some case studies uh, about like which kinds of decision making structures in those contexts are better, uh, right? And at least for evidence-based decision making. Um, so. Thank you, thank you for that. Um, we've got a few questions coming in. Um, first of all, uh, Dan Feeney, um, it's actually got two questions. Uh, the first one is, does the Dunbar 150 human network model still hold in a digital first um, you know, society? Um, you know, the, the 150 being the you know the great biggest number of connections we can reasonably manage as a human being. Um, but secondly, asking how we can reduce groupthink, um, particularly in politics. You know, we're sort of driving to ever more echo chambering of policymaking, um, leading to catastrophes and crises, really, uh, which are affecting the democratic outcomes. So are there ways we can use your thinking uh, to reduce groupthink? Both of those are great questions. Um, I mean, one of the things that is, I think, exciting about the work we're doing and the, the simulational framework we've um, developed, I, I say we, really, it's my colleague in computer science that's, that's developed the, the computational framework. Um, but one of the uh, exciting things about that is that we can really model uh, networks at scale, right? Very, very large. I mean, you know, I, I mentioned a thousand node network, but of course we, we have tried out simulations on tens of thousands of nodes and so on. And, and um, uh, you know, uh, look forward to doing work on million node networks and and, and beyond um, and I think you know in that's part of um, what's happening in the, in the digital age is that people actually do have access to much broader networks than they uh, and hitherto of course you know this is often mediated right so um, you know you may be connected to an influential node some of those influential nodes in, in the network might not be sort of individual people but they might be organizations that represent large uh, large communities you know um, take take our funders the Royal Society right? they, they represent the scientific community um, here here in Britain and, and beyond uh, and so they can potentially collate information from multiple sources and then share it out uh, as well to a, a broader audience so um, anyway the, uh, I guess it may be that individually we can kind of only manage 150 uh, uh, connections um, uh, carefully, but uh, we of course get information from uh, networks that are much broader than that, and, and we can model that, which is which is nice. Um, on the kind of group think, I mean that's sort of related to this, the the uh, the so-called Zolman effect that uh, I was reporting, um, right? So uh, it should be said that in 
this work really does focus on small um, small networks, uh, you know. But what uh, has been found is that actually it can be advantageous to have a little bit less connectivity because then um, uh, some misleading evidence, um, right? It can be perfectly earnestly found uh, evidence, but you know you can toss a, a coin that's biased towards head and it can still land tails four times, uh, uh, six times, sorry, right? Um, so um, it, it's actually can be advantageous to put the brakes on sharing that information, right? Have um, a series of communities that are engaged in investigating this question that are somewhat isolated from each other and then they share uh, findings uh, a little less frequently. So that's that was the qualification to the connect to epistemically prosper, um, right? That, that actually it can be a little bit, it can be helpful to connect a little less in, in certain kinds of circumstances. Thank you, thank you. Um, my colleague Ian Harris, um, first of all says it's a fascinating talk, but he's trying to understand where large media actors fit into the model. So agents such as the BBC, you know, Twitter or X, and newspapers, which who weren't around much at the time of Francis Bacon, um, but also wondering whether deliberate bad actors kind of mis compared with misinformed actors, the disinformation spreaders you know, fit in with your models of information, disinformation, knowledge. Yeah, that's another great question. Um, so, I mean, we do, we do have some, uh, Bad actors, um, right? We have introduced those, but they are effectively, um, you know, small-scale bad actors. They're they're just liars, uh, individual liars, kind of thing. Um, one of the aims of the work on measures of group belief has been to to think about how we can um, kind of get larger scale. Um, uh, agents, I guess. Um, Kind of represented and one of the things that's been emerging from that work at least in my own thought about it uh, is that uh, we need to distinguish between say the scientific community and the royal society that represents them uh, or between you know the, the the british public and the bbc to broadcast to them or, or what have you um, and we can actually introduce uh, organizational nodes into our networks um, and model how they work and then there's a question of mapping you know real uh, ecosystems. Uh, I've got a PhD student just started uh, with me two, two months ago um, uh, now um, who's interested in, in fact-checking organizations. So she's starting to um, look at how we might model the way that they fit into the informational environment, right? And obviously, uh, if there's fact-checkers, then there's going to be um, some um, agents that uh, our organizations like say the BBC, uh, that are also disseminating very widely uh, and representing certain communities. So that's um, that's work that we're uh, interested in doing uh, so far. That what we've been looking at is kind of peer-to-peer -peer, uh, communication. Cheers. Um, Hugh Peirce has um, got two questions. So, you know, did, did, is the implication of your work that the king or the, being, being the king or the queen means you can define truth? Um, but secondly, um, presumably the definition of what's true can change over time. For example, you get new information, new science, new science that's published. Um, and again, is that something which you could apply this to and are thinking of applying it to? So this one, I want to resist a little bit, uh, to say, um, you know, it's good to be king, but it's not that good to be king. Uh, so, um, I think what, what an implication is, is that, um, you know, kings and other influential agents can define perceptions of truth. Uh, that's not the same as defining the truth. So, you know, uh, um, I want to kind of stand up and, and uh, defend the truth is why I flagged that assumption that we, we are assuming that there is a fact of the matter here for the agents to be tracking, right? If it's, you know, whether vaccines work or whether climate change is man-made or whatever, there's a fact. And so, you know, scientists try to discern those facts and there's, um, you know, another phrase that I've heard is uh, that, you know, the, the thought that the facts can change. I actually don't think the facts can change. It's just that our knowledge of the facts changes. Um, and, you know, that's, that is an important phenomenon, right? That really does happen. We, we get some misleading evidence. We form a consensus opinion that, you know, this is the case, uh, only to discover down the line that, um, you know, we, we overlooked something. And um, so there's, um, 
you know, I think of the truth as a kind of uh, or uh, a norm or, or uh, ideal that we uh, our inquiry is oriented towards, right? And um, we do our best to to discern it, and sometimes um, we fail, and uh, we are more likely to fail, right? One of the things key findings that we that we have is when we start introducing myths and disinformance disinformants into our communities, uh, right? Where um, you know the disinformants in particular are not um they're not acting in, in good faith uh, with, the, with the communal uh, epistemic good uh, in mind right um then yes we can we can end up uh, perceiving the truth to be other than what it is and that can be dangerous in certain circumstances i mean again you know come back to my opening gambit uh if, if what um we perceive is that the uh, train to paris goes from Paddington will be disappointed when we try to act on that. Uh, so, you know, it, it, it is quite important to get things right in, in some of these contexts. And um, so people uh, influencing opinion away from the truth is, is, is a dangerous thing. Thank you. And of course, you should never uh, suggest to a philosopher that truth change because any, any perceptions of truth can change, obviously, over time. Um, so <laughs> thank you for uh, c correcting, our, correcting our, our thinking on that. Uh, Isabella Roberts has asked a question, just wondering whether you have views on the current cyber attack on the British Library, um, which is keeping effectively its contents hostage um, in relation to public access to knowledge and opportunity for epistemic growth. Um, you know, and you could broaden that from just the British Library to sort of generally, you know, attempts to suppress um, knowledge communities. It's a great question. Uh, I, I, I received an email from the British Library about that uh, about that attack. Um, my understanding is that it has meant that uh, some online services are not available um, in person uh, access to the to the. Uh, deposits there um, is unaffected. Um, so that obviously means that um, people, you know, who can easily get to London uh, uh, continue to be able to access that information while others don't. There's obviously a kind of social justice uh, dimension there, right? Uh, it's not just that we need the goods, but we need the goods to be distributed <laughs> for, uh, in, in, in appropriate ways. Um, I don't know, I have to say much more about the um, the British Library case than, than that. Um, um, but I do think, you know, there are real in issues in information ethics. I'm leading a research cluster actually at, uh, at the Eastern University of London on AI and information ethics. And the, the information ethics piece is really uh, engaging with things like um, mis and disinformation, uh, but, but also just more generally, um, you know, what the uh, rights of access to information might be as well as um, uh, so, so that uh, you know, I mean, if you, when I've looked at the the legal frameworks for this, for example, um, you know, um, the UN Declaration, uh, uh, whatever it is, 1948, uh, you know, points to people's um, rights to access information. Of course, the context there was uh, the Cold War, and um, you know, thinking that uh, it's good to have things like Radio Free Europe, uh, it, transmitting information to um, places where information was. Uh, access to information was re was restricted, uh, so you know I think people need to get access to good information. They also, in my view, need some protection against uh, against bad information um, because it's it's actually quite harmful. So navigating that uh, that kind of trade off again is is it's not an easy challenge, but it's one that I think we need to take on. Coming towards the end of the session, but I've got a question here from Shane Drinian, which mirrors something I was thinking about as well, that you know, one of your assumptions in building these models that the agents are rational and receptive to evidence. Um, but how do you think including irrational or solipsistic agents you know, would affect the, the modelling and the findings you might discover? Question. Um, a few things to say about that, honestly. Uh, so one of them is that we did, although I said that we were only modeling rational agents, um, we did look at these um, homophily-based mistrust uh, uh, um, models. And in those, the agents actually depart from rationality, from, from um, ideal rationality, uh, because they're discounting evidence, not because they have evidence that that evidence is bad, uh, but rather because uh, of their similarity to 
other agents or their dissimilarity from those other agents. Um, so we have actually looked a little bit at, uh, at modeling irrational agents and one of the uh, findings there is that polarization can happen uh, and that's uh, that can be a um, disadvantageous um, situation. Uh, that said, those those agents are irrational in a kind of systematic way, not in um, the way that you know we might expect given some findings in psychology about uh, various foibles that, uh, that, that affect us. Um, there are people who do work on um, uh, similar things that um, treat agents as not really rational at all. Um, so I'm thinking, you know, the, 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 the philosopher Dan Dennett uh, has a very nice distinction, at least 50 years old now. Uh, he's, um, anyway, it's between those of our conditions that are personal level attributes or per personal level features and those that are subpersonal. Uh, how our visual system works, say, is a subpersonal psychological feature. Um, but, you know, what we do and what we uh, think, those are things uh, that apply properly to us as, as persons. Uh, and so I've seen considerable um, modeling in um, what my colleague David Lazar calls computational social science uh, that uh, treats agents as like, for example, um, bound by a um, attention limit, right? And that's that's a sort of non-rational aspect of, of uh, you know, arguably of human nature. Um, uh, exactly what the evidence is for what the limit on our attention might be, right? That that's up for grabs. Um, but I uh, I'm actually keen to um, push the modeling of rational agents as far as we can because I think it's it's um, good to get explanations for why things happen uh, in society, not just uh, uh, predictions that they will happen or um, uh, accounts of how they can arise. Um, and you know, I think it's also um, kind of ennobling of, of uh, human beings to to treat them as um, people that have opinions and the, where those opinions are subject to evidence and so on, um, you know, maybe if we uh, think of ourselves in that way more, we'll, we'll, we'll be that way a little, a little more uh, as well. Um, and we can see that even with those assumptions, right, there are some real dangers here around uh, people getting manipulated in, in various ways um, by, by bad actors. So, uh, you know, um, we can try to, uh, add to our models, add in these irrationalities, my inclination is to do that at a later stage, uh, effectively see how far we can get without those assumptions and then tweak uh, at, uh, at, the, at the final stages, as it were. Well, thank you very much. Um, Dan Feeney's come back with a follow-up question. He's be, being rather, rather um, mischievous, I think. Uh, he also um, comes from the US originally. He asked, any predictions on the US elections, given your research on rationality and ethical acting? <laughs> Yeah, that is, uh, that's, a, that's a big question. I mean, certainly um, there's lots of reason to be um, concerned that there will be a lot of misinformation uh, promulgated um, in 2024, uh, you know, or um, in the U.S. election context. I mean, just to say that um, I've been engaged with some partners here in the UK as well. Um, there's an organization called Alliance for Europe who are uh, concerned about this issue in the, in the European context um, as well. Um, and I think rightly so. You know, there's uh, not only, of course, um, is it cheaper than ever now to generate uh, verbal content, right? um, written content, textual content uh, using AI, but also uh, deep fake um, video content is possible and so on. And, uh, you know, um, I think it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a big issue. I don't know how it's going to play out. <laughs> um, if, I, if I could have a crystal ball, I, you know, that'd be great. But, uh, but I think it's, it's really important to, to begin to tackle it. And so, um, you know, uh, I think there are efforts uh, afoot to, 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 to push back and, and make sure that there is good fact checking, that there is good uh, even um, interception of, of um, you know, bot promulgated uh, propaganda in, a, in advance using both technical means and uh, human in the loop kind of 
yeah. oversight as well. So knock on wood that that, that works. <laughs> It's effective. Well, thank you very much. Uh, we, time has beaten us. Um, I'm sure we could have gone on with the discussion. There's a few other thoughts in my mind, but uh, we might uh, meet up at another time to have those uh, conversations. Um, so just some, some thanks. First of all, to um, th thank again our sponsors um, who support us in um, building this knowledge network we're trying to keep going and to continue to uh, broaden the fields of our inquiries. Um, we've got some interesting uh, content coming up for you uh, tomorrow, Making the Future. The opportunities in digital manufacturing. Uh, next Tuesday, financial literacy education and whether it's fit for purpose. Uh, Thursday next week, why is culture divorce from finance theory? So uh, plenty of rich content still coming up um, before we uh, enter the Christmas break. Um, Ian Harris has just uh, asked me to you know, pass on his thanks uh, to Brian for his fascinating talk and thoughtful answers to questions and I'd like to Add my thanks as well to Brian. Uh, Brian, if we were in a large lecture hall, you would know to get a standing ovation, um, but we can't offer you that uh, over the, with the current technology. Um, so just for me to say uh, thank you very much to you all for attending. Thank you, Brian, for a fascinating talk, and we'll see you all soon. Thank you. Thank you as well, Mike. Thanks, Mike, and thanks to the audience here uh, for the great questions. <laughs>